at this time of um, unbelievable uncertainty and cost down, the John Boy model, uh, I think it's the John Boy companies. Um, is that what you, you had this holding company? Uh, yep. Right? The website? Okay. Um, the John Boy, the John Boy um, model, I would say, of especially with what he did with WinRAR. Um, I mean, when I went to Barack's house in Shanghai, he, we had a discussion and he showed me how he runs his business, similar to I do. But because he's a tech business, everything was there. And he has every checklist for his secretaries to get coffee in the German office. So he doesn't have to manage. <laughs> everything is laid out, which was very impressive to me um, on many levels because retaining employees, teaching employees, training, everything was collective. And so I want to explore that in this and let him really come out and advise people in small business. What do you do when you want to create efficiency and you don't have a lot of cash and you know, you want to do something big. Welcome to the mentor of mentors, Mr. John boy. You don't hear him on media, but you hear him today. That's kind of stuff. (laughs) Well, thank you very much for having me. And uh, I will gladly share some of the tricks uh, and, uh, it's, it's basically something that, that has become a second nature for me because ever since I started uh, WinRAR, uh, it was all about how can I do things without actually being there on site. So uh, one of my philosophies was um, I don't want to be blinded by day-to-day operations. I don't want to be... Uh, following all the problems that that our office is living through every day. I want to stay with an open mind and I want to be the visionary in the company. I want to be the guy who gives direction. So uh, I was able to do that because with Andrew, my business partner, I have a guy in the office who is who is an awesome COO. Uh, he was able to always take care of everything going on in the office and uh, was, was smart enough and creative enough to, to tackle all the day-to-day operational problems so that I could always say, well, I, I'm basically going to outline everything. I'm going to think about strategy. I'm going to think about the tech. I'm going to think about where we want to take this company um, and not so much worry about how we're actually going to get there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so I had that luxury that from the beginning, when we moved the office out of out of uh, my space to Trier, where Angel was studying, I put 500 kilometers between myself and and my company. And uh, I was taking the train on Mondays or Tuesdays to go to the office, working hard for two three days, uh, playing hard for three four days, and uh, basically it was always how can I do things uh, in a way that allow me to monitor uh, success rather than monitor uh, everything that's going on. And uh, mm. Mm. With, with, with having WinRAR, it kind of made sense to multiply the philosophy of a compression software, which is all about cutting out repetitions, keeping things small. And we said, why not use that same philosophy for the company. So Mm -hmm. when you talk about compression, um, it's all about how do I efficiently solve this amount of data to be stored in, in some way. Um, So what one sec, one sec, Mr. John boy, before, before you continue, I think we should formally um, introduce you so that the audience gets (laughs) to understand everything about WinRAR your decompression file and what started your whole journey on entrepreneurship. Usually, right. so I, I'm sorry sure. for interrupting, but I want to get that formality. No on. Usually Scott interrupts. Yeah, I mean, you started, you started rolling. Well, because like, well, that's he's good stuff. He's excited, man. He's got you totally excited. I can tell. <laughs> this, is, this, is the, uh, this is usually when Mr. Holbrook introduces you, but today I think I'm going to uh, because you're a good friend of mine and because I'm so excited to have you today, I'm going to be the, uh, the, the, the host. So here we go. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome. My name is Adam Paul Smolak. I'm here with my co-host, Scott Holbrook, uh, and we're, uh, we have a treat today. Uh, we're here with um, an old friend, 
uh, uh, one of my very few mentors as an entrepreneur. I've had very few mentors in my life, and uh, Mr. Barack Chanboy is one of them, and uh, also uh, a gentleman who is just the master of efficiency. And if you're a small business, medium, large organization, you're going to want to hear what he has to say. So uh, once again, thank you, uh, Barack John Boy, for joining us on Any Strike the Edge uh, today. We're excited to get started. Um, and we are just uh, before this introduction been talking about a little bit about WinRAR. Um, and you were mentioning your product and efficiency. So if you could start from the beginning uh, and course. just tell quickly your, your story, your background, and uh, a little bit of your philosophy, which we'll explore. Sure, sure. So, um, well, I've been, I've been running WinRAR, the uh, company in Germany that is the global exclusive publisher of WinRAR, the compression software, uh, for now uh, 18 years. So in February 2002, um, we, we started a company together with my business partner, Unjo, and uh, took over pretty much uh, after finishing the, the foundation of the company, the formation of the company, we took over the global distribution rights uh, of WinRAR in a uh, very unusual event. Uh, so basically was hap what happened, and I've never told this publicly, but um, our predecessor, Ron Dwight, he passed away in a situation where, where we were getting WinRAR Limited started in Germany. And uh, he was one of my few mentors at that time. We've been spending a lot of time over the phone for approximately two years after I had met him in Germany. So I've been dealing with WinRAR for now uh, 20 years or so in a professional uh, environment. And uh, I've known the software for a while before uh, in, my, in my computing days. Uh, I'm only 44, so uh, that makes me still a young entrepreneur when I, when I started everything. And uh, so we started uh, WinRAR in, in my home, in my apartment, 55 square meter apartment in Bremen. And uh, as I was telling before, Right from the start, I was trying to put as much distance in between myself and the company as possible in order to uh, separate myself from from day to day operations. Um, not as I didn't want to know what's going on, but I didn't want to be uh, blinded by, in German, there's a word for that. I don't know if that exists in German, but basically it's called something like operational blindness or business blindness, where you're, you're trapped in, in all the uh, things going on in your company and you tend to forget about why you're doing things, how you mm. got there, where you're trying to go. Mm. And I never wanted to be in that, in that position. I said, I want to be as far away from daily operations as I can without, without not knowing what is actually going on. So from day one, it was, uh, it was a balance of how can I make sure that I still know what's going on without actually overseeing everything the moment it's happening. And um, what, one sec, one sec, because I want to, sure. I want to give our audience an understanding when you talk about um, providing distance from an office or focusing on strategy, let's be clear. Um, what your the breadth of your business is from what i understand when i met you 20 years ago um in buffalo new york at a software convention where you are already the big dog um because uh, i came with robert mao a famous entrepreneur from Jiangsu, china and uh, we attended this um uh, freeware convention in buffalo and um you had the large penthouse you were sponsoring the party and WinRAR at that point. Um, and I remember Digital River was also pretty big. Right. Um, and uh, you were, you two were the behemoths, but you were the one that was um, kind of sponsoring uh, the party and uh, the good time and bringing everyone together. So at that point, I learned about WinRAR and Freeware, um, which was kind of nascent at that point. I don't know if it was nascent. You, you would know more. 
you took um, what Mr. Dwight, um, unfortunately in his passing, um, and you took that to a huge level of, um, I believe you have over a billion users um, and you're in over 120 countries or you could, you could uh, give us more details on that, but the, give, it, give the audience an understanding of the breadth of business that you've built. Uh, well, before I come to the sheer numbers, uh, I'll dig deep into my <laughs> repertoire of anecdotes <laughs> and uh, I'll put it uh, like this when, when people from the US, those really big hotshot uh, finance investors would be asking about WinRAR and uh, they didn't know who we were, what we were doing. I'd say things like, well, have you ever heard of Amazon? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, Amazon, we know. Well, have you ever heard of Google? Oh, yeah, of course, Google, yeah. Have you ever heard of Facebook? Oh, man, yeah, of course, what are you talking about? Well, we have more users in China than all of those three combined. Yep. Now, us three, having lived in China, we know why. <laughs> but, but it was such a huge... Uh, uh, thing that they couldn't grasp. They couldn't grasp that there was something as big in some other country as one of the or three biggest country, uh, biggest companies in the internet. And me being bold enough to say, you know what, put all three of them together and I'm still bigger. Um, so what was it? We were, we were happy and lucky. I was very lucky to be taking over a company that had a product and the user base that was already existing at that time. Right. And, um, the, the fun thing about WinRAR was that right from the start, and this is like I said before I was even involved, was that there was a huge uh, community interaction going on already on the development level of the software. So a lot of people who, who were using WinRAR in their home country uh, made a sport out of, well, you know what, I've been using this. Uh, I'm kind of a front runner in my market. Uh, I'm, let me just put this on a website so people start coming and, and asking me questions about the app. Then I might as well translate it into the local language. Uh, then even more people come and ask questions. Now they're trying to buy from me. And these guys who just were WinRAR users became translators, uh, localizers, supporters in different countries in the world. And uh, at the time when I started, we were already present with 50 languages. And uh, that was uh, just short of uh, Windows translations available and way ahead of anybody else having translations in software. Around. Now, um, why was that? Because we had an amazing guy in Taiwan who uh, felt like, yeah, this is a great tool and I've been using it and I'm going to help these guys to develop it in a way that it makes it easily translatable for everyone else. So we were one of the very first, again, this is before me, so I'm taking credit here that I don't deserve. But um, so at that time, WinRAR was already translated into both traditional and simplified Chinese, which mm. is uh, in the time when, when Unicode was the magic buzzword in, in advertising, uh, people trying to get their apps, or it was still called software back then, uh, their software on a Unicode translation platform or a development platform, we were already using Unicode in Chinese, like I said, simplified traditional Arab, uh, Thai, Philippine, Malay, uh, and all those other kind of languages uh, that, that uh, yeah, didn't, didn't use Latin characters. And that gave us an, a huge advantage in those markets. And uh, so the, the number of... So what you're talking about, I'm sorry, sorry for to interrupt for a second. What you're talking about is localization, that yes. you mastered the process of localization and putting your software into Malay, into local oh. languages that other, is that what you're saying? That's, that's like I said, this was before I actually had anything to do with WinRAR. This was okay. what, what I took over. But this is very important to understand so uh, you will understand how WinRAR got to the popularity that it has. So I was going to say uh, we, we never reached a billion users. However, 
we might have because um, because we have been so strict about the way we deal with customer data that we never actually had any way of counting. But from dealing with our partners, basically we knew that any any Windows machine in China, any Windows machine in Russia, any Windows machine in Eastern Europe, any Windows machine in any of those countries that I mentioned before, or languages that I mentioned before that was using Unicode or non-Latin character sets, uh, we were basically exclusive on all those machines. Mm. Um, we, had, we had gotten to a point where people would, uh, would have a tool set of four or five tools that were, they would install on every new machine, and WinRAR would be the first of them. So um, being in that position gave us a head start on, on what I was able to do later. So um, I, I was kind of in this already made nest where, uh, where I could deal with a lot of partners globally that were already existing and I could focus on allowing them to become more professional, better sales oriented, more marketing oriented. Um, because like I said, a lot of these guys who, who had been dealing with WinRAR were kind of amateurs, not in a negative way, but uh, they, they were um, working in their daytime jobs and out of just fun because of seeing WinRAR isn't available in their local language, they would translate it. And from translating it, they became supporters. From supporting it, they became sellers. And uh, we had a whole bunch of partners who, who were doing their daytime jobs, like the guy in Japan. We, we'd be selling a whole lot of single user licenses to Japan. It used to be our longest invoices because everyone was buying single user licenses in Japan. And this guy was, was just working it an hour or two a day on WinRAR. And uh, so, so my beginning stage was, was seeing this potential that you have all those motivated people there, but actually there is not a, um, not a corporate design globally. There is not, um, not a vision globally. There is not a technology platform for the people available that are dealing with this that will make their life easier and allowing them to just continue doing uh, their fun part of the business because we were able to develop something that would support them in doing so. So, so that's where, where I kind of kicked in. So, so that's user collaboration at its finest. It seems like you almost mastered user collaboration. Well, would, would you say this was also like maybe the beginnings of like, uh, like, like open source? Um, you know, people coming in and then they're, you know, they got access to, you know, when are there and they're you know, starting off with the translations, but I'm sure some of them had ideas on how to make it better and stuff. Like, do you see yourself as one of the, you know, the progenitors of, of this open source movement? Um, well, we have to, um, to, to be very careful about uh, what open source means here because, uh, open source is based on, um, uh, is, is kind of the the license term of the software that you're dealing with. So right. the open source movement uh, is comparable to what I was describing, uh, what we're doing together with the translators, but it's something uh, that has uh, a total different start. So basically it's from the beginning something where you say, I have a project, I want to make it available for everyone. I want to have as many people as possible come together and work on this project. And whatever comes out of it is probably going to be free for everyone else to use. Whereas we, from the start, had to make money from selling WinRAR. So uh, the balance here was to have user interaction and user support. How can you have people helping us uh, when the goal is to make as much money as possible from this? So, so we were, from the beginning, in a business uh, perspective, and, and this was a, a start. I mean, we had just started the company. We based our future on the success of, of this company. I, I stopped studying uh, because I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I'm, I'm, I dropped out of school and said, this is, this is what I want to do. This is what's going to make me money. So uh, it was not like, oh, yeah, I'm going to do my thing, and, uh, and this is a project. Let's have as many people come together and work on it which is more of the open source thing. I'm not saying that there's not people making money in open source. Uh, definitely there's great tools, 
but the approach was different from from our point from the beginning it was we have to make money from this so um yeah, yeah. so so winrar is a proprietary software and uh and the way we we managed to solve this problem was basically to to say you know what there's a cake that's big enough for all of us and and let's cut pieces out of the cake and share it with everyone who's helping us so um yeah so your your background i want to switch a little bit to how you pushed it out because you from what i understand you left a banking internship um was that in bremen germany itself i actually finished my banking trainee program so so i'm a okay. the only the only profession that i've actually learned uh, is a banker so in germany you have this uh a uh, program where you can do a two, two and a half, or three year uh, trainee program and become a certified banker. So that's what I am. I did that in two years. And uh, after that, I was working for a banking consultancy company. And uh, I started international management and business uh, in uh, Bremen at the, uh, uh, the University of Applied Sciences. And during that time is when I when I started WinRAR and and said yeah I'm going to drop out of college this is uh, this is big this takes takes energy this is this is going to work out this is going to make us money and uh, yeah I I do kind of regret it at some point uh, that I don't have a college degree yet uh, however um, uh, everything else in life that a college degree would have been good for I was able to to do with WinRAR so. You also studied in the United States, I believe, in Washington as a as a, as a young man. In Oregon. 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 Excuse in me. In Oregon. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I went to uh, to high school in Cresswell, Oregon, which is a small place just south of Eugene, Oregon, where Nike mm. started. And uh, yeah, I was there when I was fifteen and a half years old. Uh, it was a it was a big dream of mine ever since I was. I think 11 or 12 and our English teacher brought two American exchange students to class. I was like, yeah, I want to do that. That's what I want to do when I'm old enough to do it. So uh, when I turned 14, I started to apply for different programs that, that offered that. And uh, I was selected and uh, yeah, and was sent to a Mormon family in Cresswell, Oregon and uh, did high school i finished uh i was upgraded there from 11th grade so i would, should have been a, uh, uh, a junior but because the school wanted me to go through the whole graduation ceremony uh they put me in the same classes with all the seniors mm -hmm. uh, which meant i had to letter in varsity football uh, i lettered in in track on the varsity team and yeah, and did everything uh, together with the guys, except for getting my high school diploma at high at Cresswell High School. Uh, but I said I'm going to do that anyway. So so I went to the local community college and, and get my high school diploma while I was in the U.S. And uh, I actually actually could have ended up going back uh, to the U.S. and playing football at MIT, uh, which was one of the colleges uh, that I got my entry into, um, but. Uh, the dollar German mark exchange rate uh, screwed me off. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I finished. <laughs> I finished. I finished school in Germany. Did another three years uh, before getting my uh, high school diploma in Germany. Did my civil service, social service in Germany, uh, which was so mandatory back then. You either had to do military service or social service for one year. And only after that, so basically at the time when I could have already finished university in, in the U.S., did I start to go to a university in Germany. Uh, first, first plan was to become a medical engineer, so I started with engineering, uh, quit that, uh, went into bank banking, finished my two-year banking program, and then uh, uh, continued on with business and international management and, and started with Winron. You're initially, you're, you're ethnically, culturally, and you might be also a citizen of Turkey, and then your family immigrated to Germany. Uh, is, is that the story, or how, how? That is correct, yes. My father was already in, uh, in Germany when I was born. My mother was waiting for me to see the light of day. And uh, then, yeah, 
a few weeks after I was born, uh, my parents, my mother took me to Germany as well. So I was raised in Germany, went to school in Germany, uh, became a German citizen and uh, lived in Germany until eight years ago when, uh, when I followed your call. <laughs> I went to call and, and decided now it's time to go to Shanghai, China. Yeah. So that, yeah, that, and that's what I kind of want to get to was from the fact that um, Turkey uh, and culturally and linguistically and then Germany and experiencing Germany and ra- growing up in Germany and then coming to the States for school. Um, you're sitting in Croatia now uh, where you invest in the country. Uh, we will talk a little bit more about that. Um, but before you made your way to Croatia, you met me in China and where you lived um, in Shanghai in a, in a beautiful place um, above the city. Uh, and um, you stayed for what, four years? Four years, yeah. And you, so you have such a amazing um, global experience, linguistic capability. Um, and I know that, and I want to tie this into, um, I think one of the secrets of your success, which is your love for people and travel. Because I remember, uh, brother, when I met you after Buffalo and I would subsequently meet you or talk to you, you were always busy, um, but we would always keep up and you would be traveling to this country, to this country, to this country. And you would meet partners. Right. The localization was key to you. Getting um, folks to represent you that were ethical, that were um, good at service, that had all the components. You were going around the world interviewing and creating distribution partners. And That's so right. I think your global uh, DNA, almost at this point, um, allowed you to go out there and to to create this distribution network, I have two questions. How many countries did you visit? And how many distributors would you say you've developed? Because Scott over here is the master of sales. He's a road warrior himself, right, Scott? And he he's developed literally hundreds of distributors. Um, so I, I think he could come in the conversation here, but how many did you develop? And just a little bit on that distribution side, globally going around and developing distribution, what was it like? Well, it was first of all an amazing opportunity. I mean, you you gotta imagine this. I'm still in in college. I'm basically sitting there and starting starting to to learn about business and international management. And the next thing I'm doing is I sit on a plane to Moscow. I sit on a plane to Taipei. I sit on a plane to Tokyo right. and and Beijing and Shanghai and uh, Bangkok and Sydney and, and and then it's the other end of the world going over to the US and Canada and coming back doing the uh, Eastern European countries and then the Western European countries and then being able to say you know what I'm going to take a time off I'm just going to go to Africa because I've never been there and uh, all this was was an amazing time because yeah I mean that's that's that was always my dream, traveling the world, seeing countries, getting to know people. And now I was able to do that as part of my job. Uh, and OK, I was traveling, uh, I was traveling uh, economy. Uh, I was ready to, to take two, three, four uh, stopovers to get from Frankfurt to, uh, to Shanghai. Um, but that was that was also kind of a fun thing to do. I I just you know meet regular people, have coffee with people, sleep on somebody's couch. Uh, if the couch wasn't there, I'd sleep on the floor, uh, and and it was all cool because I was seeing the world. I was getting to know people, and and uh, it was still in a time where uh, we didn't know how how successful this thing was going to become. I mean. WinRAW was already out there. WinRAW was already making money, but it wasn't sure if that was going to support not only myself, but also my business partner and people in the office. And uh, in a way that that, that we would say, yeah, we're going to grow this to something uh, that's going to be sustainable and is going to give us a returning revenue over a long period of time. That was all unsure. It was all still a huge adventure with... 
uh, trying to make another 50 cents and, and trying to make another dollar, another two, another 10. Uh, and uh, But yeah, doing that in China, doing that in Asia, doing that in places where others didn't even imagine you could make money selling software, that was cool. Uh, and, and talking about developing people um, and, and sales partners, I would say we developed a few, but the one that I was really after and that I, that I took in as kind of my big thing was the guy in China, in Shanghai. And, uh, and, and there, was, there was three or four uh, emails coming in just after we had taken over the business of people saying, yeah, we already have a deal. Uh, we are already certified as, as the next big partner in China. And, and I was like, no, I don't believe this, man. I'm just going to go and see for myself. So one of the very first decisions, yes, was to say, I'm going to go to China and see what's going on. And I picked uh, Quast and Oliver Gu back then after talking to all those guys who had, who had sent emails and, uh, and was able to grow him until 2008. So 2002 uh, was when we made the deal. And 2008 was the year when we sold more licenses in China than in any other country in the world. So... Um, and, and I mean, this is China now. You, you know how the Chinese... So, yeah. Uh, we, we are selling software. We're not selling cars. We're not selling diamonds. We're not selling jewelry. We're not selling... Like hard some things. Some other tangible... We're selling software licenses. And in a time where, where, where yeah, <laughs> people are running WinRAR on, on hacked Windows XP uh, software. So the, the operating is hacked and cracked, but the guys were paying for WinRAR because we managed to set up a distribution network with my partner and he was able to say, okay, I'm gonna put at some point 55 telesales agents on this. We're gonna pick up the phone and call people. And they're gonna tell them that this is not right. They're gonna tell them that software is not free. They're gonna tell them that uh, these guys are cool. They're gonna tell them that it's it's cool to pay for software because uh, not only because the the uh, WTO is actually expecting it from China as a new member, but we want to support our country doing things the proper way. So uh, that was the trick. That was that was why traveling around. That's why talking to the people was so important because I had to find out what actually sticks. And, uh, and, and I remember one of the very first conversations in China with Oliver was, he was telling me, Borak, how can I sell a software, one software for $30 if I can go to the next corner and buy a CD for $1 with 30 titles on it? And, and it was overcoming this Forget all that, what we have, that's the status quo. That's what Chinese are used to right now, but that's not the right way. Right. We need to educate our partners. We need to educate people that yes, the proper way is paying $30 for just one software, which is WinRAR. We're gonna give you huge discounts if you buy multiple licenses. Uh, if we see you're being honest, if we see you wanna buy our software, but you can't afford to, well, we're going to find a solution for that. We don't want to make anybody uh, lose money on, we don't want anybody overextending themselves in order to, to pay for software, but we got to have you understand, dear business partner, that when you're using our software for free, then you're actually stealing from us. Right. And... Uh, and another anecdote here, so I'm staying in Shanghai at, uh, at, uh, at one of those famous first uh, hotels uh, next to the Punong River where Albert Einstein had stayed and, and some former U.S. presidents had stayed. And, uh, and I'm going to the, to the internet cafe, and this guy has WinRAR on all machines. There's, there's 10, 12 uh, computers in, in the internet cafe. And, and he has WinRAR installed in all of them. And uh, I managed to, to trade. I managed to trade and gave him a license for WinRAR for being allowed to use in the Internet Cafe Unlimited for one week during my stay at the hotel. And you'd say today now, oh, that's obvious. But 
I had to work hard to have him actually accept that. And I felt proud because I personally sold the very first license in China myself. I didn't get money for it, but I got more than, than the money could have bought me because I was on the <laughs> online the whole time, all the free time in China. I was doing business in the internet cafe, and I'm sure it would have cost me a lot more paying for it than, than what the licenses cost us. So, um, yeah, that, that was a, a fun thing seeing. And from that, I took energy into all those meetings and, 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 and talking to, to guys who had totally no understanding of uh, what I was talking about. I, I mean, how pay for software? Yes. Everybody has it. I mean, why would I pay for it? And, and, and getting there, teaching them, it's the same issues we had in Russia, same issues we had in the Western countries, pretty much in most Asian countries, we had the same issues. And it was constant education, constant conversation, and constantly motivating people to say, you know, this is sales. You're not going to be successful with every single call, but you got to keep going. You got to keep going. You got to change your strategy if it doesn't work out. And if you don't know what you want to try, call me. Let's be creative together. I'm here. I'm going to tell you what was working in other countries. I'm going to tell you what was not working in other countries. And uh, so, so that was the, right. the fun part of, of traveling around, even though I didn't build a lot of partners personally, except for the, for the guys in China, I was always the one who was kind of uh, sharing uh, best case scenarios, use cases with them, trying to explain what they can do, how they can do, and, and keeping them motivated. I mean, that's all it is, right? It's about trying, keep keep going, try it again, try it again. If it doesn't work, change something, try in a different way, or try asking somebody else, try finding somebody for help, look at what others are doing. And uh, and that, that's what it was for, yeah, 18, it's been going on. And uh, and yeah, until until I went to China uh, eight years ago, that was my, uh, my big thing, going around and teaching everyone. Well, and, and I think that shows my takeaway from that. It shows how how difficult, but how easy it is to build a business as a classic traditional entrepreneur. Your story is amazing, and your uh, decision making is outstanding. But what you did to get there was you identified a really good product when you were in college. You took risk because you saw the reward was high. You got involved in a nascent industry that you thought you could win. You did what you were supposed to do and what you saw the easiest way for water to see crack was to localize and to get global uh, installment of this product. You then bump into China, and that's what fascinates me the most, and that's what I think, above all else, it's an amazing story, but you talk about Oliver Gu and these folks um, who I've heard about before, obviously, and we've talked about, um, but then you... You, you recognize what other folks don't, that China is, is malleable. It's workable. You can do it. And so you double down and you move there with your family. Um, and your son's an outstanding, uh, um, you know, brain. And he got all this benefit of going to China. And I know you did it for familiar reasons to give culture to your family. And that's wonderful. But you also did it. Because you thought that by being in China and by being in Shanghai, you could really make dents and you doubled down at a time when people weren't doubling down. Right after a financial crisis, you know. So just, just give me, from your vantage point, what that felt like going and bringing to another language, to another culture in your mid-30s to get into a market that everybody said was... You know, you were showing traction, but you went there to win. What, what was that? Well, actually, you know what? We had already won the market the moment I went there, and it was rather uh, a, a struggle of not to lose it. 
Mm. So um, it was as much as it was an external force, um, it was also the right thing the moment we decided to do it. So, so why did we go? Um, there's, there's two business decisions here that, that we took. Uh, one being that we had seen uh, pretty much a great, great return, as I said, in sales in China, um, all coming pretty much from the business side of things. And a huge, I mean, hundreds of millions of users in China who don't pay a cent for using our software. And we said, okay, well, um, now may be the time to say we turn the software into an ad-based software that becomes free for private usage. And, and we'll try to make money off of the ads that we show. So um, having made that decision, it came, how can I do something so important for our strategy in China without actually being there? And the answer was, I better not. So it was, I have to be there. I have to oversee it. This is way too important a decision for our software. It is way too big a user base that is being affected by our decision um, that even though I've been working with my partner together for 10 years and I trust them, I cannot risk the success of our company on that trust alone. I must be there to feel exactly every change that we're doing and the effects that it will have. Um, so, so that was one thing that we said, okay, if, if we're going to do that in China, I must, somebody, somebody very important in our company must be present to oversee that process. And because we're a very small company, uh, there was only my business partner and me left that we said, that's who we can afford to actually send. And you know how horrendous the salaries are for experts that, that go to China. So I said, no, I'm not going to pay anybody else who doesn't know our software. Uh, to do that, I'm going to do that myself, and I'm going to oversee that. So that was one thing. The well, other thing so just, just to be clear real quick, so then that the decision to go to an ad-based model was made strictly in China initially, then, right? And so that China was, I guess, your rollout of an ad-based yes. model. You went there, tested, and then, yes. okay. Yes, because uh, like I said, we had this huge user base in China, and we already knew we don't have much to lose because they're not paying. They're not paying anyway. So why not? is why not you at uh, uh, that market where we're present, where I have trusted partners and, uh, and where we already are a brand. And, and that was something I wasn't so aware of before going to China uh, was the, the importance of brands, and uh, it, especially in China, that is. So, um, so uh, for me, it was more about how do I not kill our brand and then I go there and I see how huge of a brand we are in that market. Um, but that's a different story. So uh, I'm there and I'm saying, I'm seeing a partner and, I'm, and this is the new thing where I'm saying, okay, we need to change the business model from actually selling licenses to our software to selling ads. And now it becomes a whole new business. It becomes a whole new partnership model. It becomes a whole new education of the staff that our partner has. And, uh, and yeah, and, and it becomes a new risk uh, because you don't want to be showing everybody's ads in, in, in our program. And especially in China where you have uh, loads of restrictions uh, on what you're actually allowed to show. Uh, it, was, it was more of a, yeah, how can we start this properly and how can we do it in a way that is not going to hurt our image in this country? But like I said, that was just the one, one pillar of our decision. I'll tell you more about the second one in a moment. Adam, you wanted to ask something. Yeah, I wanted to ask. Thank you. Thank you. So to be clear here, you just said to me that because people weren't buying, but I want to make a delineation. Your corporate licenses are still being sold. You wanted to open up another model for your retail client who weren't paying for it. Is that correct? Um. Not exactly. We still had, yes, we still had uh, business clients paying, 
but we already saw that it's on the decline. So, um, so basically, uh, we were saying let's let's do things like an insurance would do. Let's take the the negative scenario. What can happen? So, if this whole this thing doesn't work out, we're not going to make any money from ads, and we're going to lose the entire ad revenue, uh, mm -hmm. the entire licensing revenue that we have from from our business partners. Uh, on top of that, we're going to lose whatever time or salary we're going to spend on having somebody there to oversee the process. So it became a, okay, I, I'm, I can compensate that risk um, because mm. I'm not going to cost my company anything going there. Uh, on the other hand, if we lose everything that we have and are totally unsuccessful with what we're trying, we still will not have lost more than it would have cost us to send somebody else to go there and do it. So, um, so, so we're talking about a highly overviable risk that we took as a company. On the other hand, obviously, you don't want to scare away hundreds of millions of users because you're right. doing things wrong. And um, so, so that's that's the one part. The other part now, this this is uh, where where another anecdote can kick in, is that we saw some major Chinese uh, software players uh, not playing by the rules. And, um, and I didn't understand the market well enough and the culture well enough at that point to know if we can solve it. Um, that being if we can solve it using lawyers, cases, partners, talking to people. So um, it was a, okay, I need to go because we're trying to do something new and I need to make sure that I find a way to, to stop these guys that are not playing by the rules uh, and, and get them in line with either what our licensing terms are or have them just stop doing what they're doing wrong. And... Uh, <laughs> If I had known what I was going to face, I probably wouldn't have gone. Uh, but uh, we, we succeeded in, in, in one of the, the huge Chinese internet companies, which you could basically compare to the state of China, uh, saying, yeah, you guys, uh, we're going to stop what we're doing wrong. And without without having any lawyers involved, except for their own lawyers, um, just by picking up the phone and calling and persuading people and trying to persuade more people and trying to find the right people. And guess what? We ended up having a rock star that was the marketing guru in their company, uh, understanding the issue and taking our side and convincing everybody that they should better not continue doing what they're doing because it's just not right. Rather than being afraid they might lose a case, it was a, guys, it's just bad. <laughs> Let's not do it. <laughs> and, yeah. and that's what I think sets you apart. Um, and I know your, your battles in India too, um, with the trademark issue of WinRAR. Um, you're, we could spend episodes, hours, discussing decision making and problem solving yeah. and that's what you and i um i'm on my 20th some company and who, who knows how many investments you have um but at the end of the day what defines it all is decision making and problem solving and you're problem solving in china you're problem solving in india and you're working it out and finding the right person um, who will listen, who you can build a, a relationship with an understanding and you can move forward with mutual benefit. And you've, you've done a great job of identifying it. I would love to talk about it, but the most, uh, this program is about optimizing businesses and optimizing right. people. And one subject, because, um, it's so interesting to me when I was in China with you, I was in Nanjing, you were in Shanghai. I would visit you 
at your penthouse in Shanghai. We'd sit there and we would talk. We'd talk at the lake, we'd come to Nanjing, we'd talk. But I remember one conversation that stood out, which is when I went to Shanghai, and we mentioned this in the beginning when we were just talking before we officially started the program. You opened my eyes because you opened my eyes to efficiency, to optimization in a, in a way that I hadn't seen before. Um, because at the time I met you, I think I had two, two polyester factories and I was running a headcount in each one of about 40 to 50 people. I had an education company. I had a nightclub. I had all this stuff going on. I had a trade company, a supply chain company, a logistics company. I had a lot of back end that was supporting different functions. And I thought I was efficient because I had five people and a six people accountants, basically. And then another office of a couple project managers that were overseeing this. And I thought I was efficient. But then I came and I talked to you in Shanghai. And you took it to a whole new level. <laughs> um, we sat in front of your computer. And we're in different businesses because you're in technology and I'm in hard product manufacturing. But we sat at your computer. And I'll never forget how you showed me your, your whole business in a screen. Yeah. And to the point that you had not communicated with your employee in Bremen, I think it was a, uh, an office admin, um, and you hadn't needed to because you had a checklist of weekly tasks and you had a larger plan, I think, developed. And um, that employee had worked with you for a while. In fact, most of your teammates stick with you for forever and you have some great talent and great people. You guys have great times and I've, and I've hung out with y'all. Um, but to see how you didn't have to communicate with that woman, but she knew exactly what to do and what to buy coffee in the office, this, this, it was a situation where if it gets to this level, restock, you ran it like I run my warehouses and that drive for efficiency, can you speak on that? And two, is this your German Turkish roots? Is this your tech background? Is this your maniacal? Because I know, in, and we can talk in a second about your experiences owning the Bremen you know, professional basketball team and now your work with the Olympics and all this, you're detailed. But where did this come from? Well, I can't exactly tell you where it came from, but I can tell you that it totally matches our product philosophy. And uh, that's what I was uh, talking about before we started recording is that uh, we made it our philosophy to say, if, if we can develop the most efficient compression software there is, mm. then as businessmen, we shouldn't run short and come short by not doing the same for our company. So the, the thing about compression or lossless compression, that is more correctly in our case, is to deal with repetitions. And that's what efficiency is about at the same time. So our software tries to cut as many repetitions down as possible and remember that for the future. So every time something that has happened before that is already stored in our WinRAR package at some point, all the software needs to do is put a marker and say, hey, look at what we had stored already back then. Like a reference. Reference, that's it. So it's a much shorter uh, information or much, much smaller data to store. And if you're going about repeating everything again. And, and I kind of made that my philosophy for, for our knowledge management internally, that I said, as hard as it may sound at this point, I'm, I'm, I'm going to actually forbid anyone to ask questions. Not because I want to forbid asking questions and not having anybody know anything, but I want to teach you guys that you need to find a way to find the answer to that question that you have, mm 
mm. without taking away the valuable time of anybody else in the company because we've already answered that question before. Mm. So it was hard to, to teach some of our staff in the beginning to say, you know what? You have to be rude to your colleague asking questions. And I know it's easier to tell him right away what the answer to that question is than telling him, why don't you please log into our knowledge base system online and put your question into the search field? And if the answer to that question is not sufficient for you, then you're glad you can gladly come back and I'll look at it. Because then there is two reasons that may be the case. It's either because no one has ever asked that question before, mm. and we must put the answer down. Or the way you are searching is not the way that the system actually understands your question. So we must then change uh, uh, the system to better understand different formulations of the same question leading to the same answer. And, and that, was, uh, that was a hard struggle at the beginning because Maybe you have already seen that, that we actually are pretty nice people talking with each other and we love communicating with each other. Um, but having to tell your colleague, you know what? No. I mean, <laughs> For it first. I did it to me all the time. And then, you ask a question, look yeah. it up. Yeah, well, guess who he learned it from? <laughs> So I was showing I was show, showing AP our knowledge base, and it was uh, I probably shared this story back then. It's it's I mean by now thousands of pages because every single workflow in our company is documented. Right. And uh, and and I was joking at some point when we started this, saying if I ever going to sell the company, uh, I'm going to charge more for the documentation of the company than actually what I'm going to charge for the sale of the business. Um, and, and, and it was a joke, but I, I by now, I, I think that's probably what it's become because, uh, I mean, just print out those thousands of pages of documentation of workflow and, and, and knowledge that we have in our company. And, and I can probably say we're not perfect, but I take a good guess that we're right up there in knowledge management in, in, in companies. And then I'll, I'll, I'll take the fight with any company on that saying we're probably a company that if the worst thing should happen that can happen to a company, then anybody else can probably come in and continue our business just by the documentation that we have prepared. So how, 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 long, how long did that, that, I guess that change process take from the time where, you know, you made the decision, you know, we're going to put all this stuff there for people to teaching, you know, your staff to, to not ask what to go search to, to the point where you say you're at now, where, you know, if the worst thing happens, the business goes on under anybody's management you know, as it was before. Like how long was that, I guess, that change, that optimization process? Um, I'd say for it to become something that lives by itself, it took a few years. But as many things, it was just the very beginning that was the most important. So we, we started this in the time when, when we, I, I told you before that I was trying to stay away from the company as much as possible, but in order to not to uh, be too separated, uh, we would have quarterly meetings where we'd bring in everybody plus some external guys. Like to physically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so like I said, I was, I was kind of, uh, uh, I, I was traveling from Bremen to Trier, which is a 450 kilometer train ride. And, and I was doing that purely to do the two, three, four days, sometimes five days uh, in the office in Trier and go back to Bremen. But we had our team of, of tech guys uh, that, were, that were in other jobs. So they were part time helping us out. And, and uh, some of them were in Bremen. Some of them were in Berlin. And we said every, every three months, we're going to come together, have a nice weekend together, do a little bit of work party in the evening and then uh, have a nice breakfast in the morning and then go back home. Um, but those those quarterly meetings were were, were uh, on one of them we said, you know what we're gonna have to we're gonna have to start doing this. We're gonna have to start putting things together 
And because of having such great tech guys, it was kind of a quick decision because they were like, yeah, it's all out there. I mean, we can set it up before this meeting is over right. because all the technology is there. Uh, it's just that nobody is really using it to the extent that we were planning to do it. And, and we didn't know that we were going to use it to that extent at that point. It was more of a, oh, well, let's, let's start documenting the stuff that we've been talking about here. Then it was a, um, well, you know, tech guys, uh, code has to be documented properly. And those were the forerunners in the company saying, well, we're going to document the code within the code. And then we're going to document the code that we're documenting for an external system so that people actually understand why we're even doing this whole thing. So, so it's two different steps. One is like, uh, I'm going from A to B and this is how I'm doing it. That's what they're putting into the code. Whereas in the, in the, um, in, in our knowledge base, they're putting, I'm actually going from A to B for these reasons. And I've tried these three, four, five, six different ways of getting from A to B and they didn't work. So we've ended up using this one. So it becomes a, uh, a much more uh, a biography. Uh, in depth and biography of what, what we're doing and every single decision that we're doing. And yeah. the good thing, like I said, was we had tech guys who were used to doing this. It was just something that me as a CEO had to say, or at that time CEO and CTO had to say, I'm going to expect this from you guys. And I'm going to control this from you guys. And now, since we're already doing it and we have in-house experience on it, we're going to do it all for everything that we're doing. So the folks out there who are listening to this program um, are either listening because they watch our program and are, we're a new program, so we're developing users, and they'll see you in a couple months or in a year or two in this, this interview. Or they're, you're a famous guy, you have a very nice cult following, and your star status is increasing. We'll get to that in a sec. Um, but they're looking at you, and they know WinRAR. But they don't understand the knowledge that you're giving them right now has been crafted over, what, 24, 25 years. You're, unlike a lot of people, giving them 100% truth of what you did with no embellishment from sleeping on floors to decision making. What I, I work with um, entrepreneurs all the time of different races, of different socioeconomics. I give no interest loans to folks. I give interest loans to folks. I'm working with entrepreneurs on every level. And what I see that what I see in you and what I hope folks can learn from you in watching this program at any time, it never gets old, how you evolve, your evolution from rec your, your ability to see a pattern is natural. Knowing localization, traveling around, understanding China was where it was, changing a model from paid to ad, not messing that up test marketing in China. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of things. But um, the diligence of the evolution of meeting every quarter and evolving that process, knowing the capabilities of your engineers and putting it together. Um, as an entrepreneur myself, I think that's the difference of success and being an entrepreneur that's not going to go very far. And you might continue for a long time. But without that evolution and without that detail, and without being unique like you are on every level of your game, emphasizing communication to the point of exhaustion, right? That's why you are who you are, and that's why winner are is one of the best non ipo companies. And people aren't, you know, all over your Instagram and all over your stuff talking about you. You have some privacy, some level of privacy, and you run big business. And so to me, that's outstanding as an entrepreneur 
Um, and I think in the entrepreneur level, there's a little jealousy um, at the high level. There's just a lot of awe, you know, for people and what they can accomplish when they have a brain and they want to put it to use. Um, so I, I commend you. Um, but just to give folks an understanding as well as how diverse Mr. John Boy's game is, you know, if you could speak on the Olympic side, you know, you, 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 in Bremen, you buy the basketball team, Bremen, uh, the Bremen Roosters, Roosters, excuse me. And you are definitely, um, an excitable, um, engaged, uh, team oriented leader. And you fight with the press a little, um, <laughs> and, uh, you also get involved where you are now in the Olympics side, I believe, in sports in Croatia. Um, I'm not quite sure where you get that from, but oh, uh, I no, I no. You... There's, there's nothing going on with Olympics right now. Okay. Uh, the, the only connection I, I ever had to the Olympics that uh, one of the kids that, that started playing basketball in Bremen with me uh, – uh, actually made it to the Olympics on the on the German basketball team, um, but yeah, so, sorry, I'm not okay. Olympic. I'm not uh, there. But, I thought you uh, were helping support some aspects um, of player development. Was my understanding? Uh, well, yes. What I was doing here uh, was that that we had a small basketball team that I was supporting as well, and uh, and 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 I was trying to get uh, uh, a youth team. Um, to to feel like they're in a professional environment, so so basically maybe that's where the the, the okay. topic uh, Olympics came up. We're saying uh, it has to be everything has to be just perfect. It has to be the jerseys have to be there. That the the game has to be set up. There's got to be drinks for the guest teams. There's got to be a reception for for the referees. There's got to be press releases before the game, after the game, etc. What we're talking about previous. So we're talking about uh, here 12, 13-year-olds uh, and the older team of 14, 15-year-olds. And, and I said, I'm going to support that. I want that. I want you guys to, to give these kids uh, an environment uh, where they don't have to worry about anything, just do something they like, uh, while at the same time actually feeling that there is a club in this small country that actually can afford to do it in a way that, that the, the grown-ups do it, the Olympics teams do it, uh, all professional teams. And, uh, and I've been supporting that for, for wow, five or six years. So it started when I was in China until two years ago. Um, and, and maybe that's where the Olympics uh, topic came up. But I also mentioned Olympics here because Split as a city is one of the... Uh, of, of the few highly successful successful Olympics cities in the world. Mm. So uh, you have uh, Tony Kukoc, uh, Dino Raja, uh, and, and a few other very famous basketball players who come here from, from Split. Uh, you have several Olympians in uh, uh, Goran Ivanisevic in tennis. Uh, you have... Yeah. Uh, uh, some some rowing guys, some uh, athletes, some sailors and uh, football players and all kinds of dis different uh, athletes who over um, the last, well, over the history of the Olympics uh, have managed to win medals. So if, if I believe the statistics uh, that some, some smart marketing guy from, from Split came up with, uh, then it has the most Olympic medals per capita so that's maybe also where where olympics uh, as a topic came up in our, yeah. in our conversations i'm very curious as to um well before i'm curious i understood your involvement in sport i guess i didn't understand exactly your level i'm not sure what you're planning in croatia um and if you're planning to get more involved in that um but i know you do a lot of things you also are a um a newly appointed political contributor uh, to a yeah, German I party. I am, um, actually, yes. Is, is, uh, and, and it's, you want to speak about that for a second? Um, yeah, sure. It's, uh, it's, it's funny enough. Uh, so the, the Social Democratic Party in Germany decided last year 
that it would make sense to to have the board of directors uh, exchange ideas directly uh, with the base members, with the basically grassroots organization, and decided they're they're going to do a lottery and pick up twenty people by lottery that will be on an advisory board uh, to the board of directors of uh, of one of the oldest parties in Germany. Where did where, the, the pool come from? Um, say again. Where'd the pool come from? Uh, a lot uh, of members. Members, yes. So uh, registered members, and and I was a member because uh, now now this going back before uh, uh, before uh, I finished school. Uh, so while I was still in school, I was very very involved in uh, in in student uh, relations and student government. So I was a class speaker coming back from from the U.S. I became the the um, the speaker for our 11th grade. I became a member of the school board. I became a member of the uh, city council. I became a member then of the newly elected youth parliament. And uh, so I was, I was quite active back then in, in, in school politics. And uh, the, the Social Democratic Party in Germany was the party that, that I thought matches my political uh, Beliefs the most, uh, which which uh, will be the Democrats in in the U.S. Um, so uh, yeah, so so I became a member back then, and uh, after starting with basketball and starting with Windrar, it just stayed. I became I kept being a member and paying my membership fee, and uh, and when they decided to draw those twenty guys, uh, they went into uh, into all membership cards or however they drew it. I don't know. Probably used a, a random uh, RNG uh, calculation on Twitter. And yeah, and and guess what? Burak Janboy is one of those twenty. So uh, yeah, I was asked if I want to accept that uh, that task, and I gladly did. So the first uh, the first things we did was. Uh, uh, we talked about we talked to the two uh, party uh, presidents and the party secretary, and put together um, our group's uh, desires and wishes for where the party should go in the future. And now it becomes uh, a process where we, we will uh, try to um, to get our topics and our views uh, in line with the with the next election program of the party and. Uh, and hopefully have some impact on on where the party is is going in the future, which I think is is an amazing thing, and uh, it, it re reignited my my passion for politics. As as I'm seeing, there's a lot of lot of unfair things going on globally, uh, with huge uh, companies abusing their their monopolies uh, right. and. and um, People like us. I mean, I'm, I'm already privileged, and, and and you are also much more privileged than, than many others in this world. But uh, still, we're 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 being this small when when it comes to 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 things where we're just having the Amazons and Microsofts and Googles and whatnots and banks, etc., do their thing, and there's not much we can do against it when we are when we are at the short end. So. Um, yeah, so so I, I have a huge uh, a desire for fairness. Uh, so so I'm hoping to to get part of that into into the the politics uh, that that I'm being involved in right now. So you're operating all of this from your this global um, empire empire from split Croatia, where you operate as well um, villas. Um, for mostly international guests that want to come and stay at your properties. Um, and they have the, uh, I, I guess you get involved and I'm sure when you have cool guests, you get involved and you, uh, you have good conversations and I know right. you like to have a drink or two with them and you're a good host. I cook um, for them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you cook for them. Oh yeah. So <laughs> Not every day, but, but if I like them, we, we try to have a nice, uh, nice Friday evening where I serve my homemade liquors and, and, and cook for them. And we, we have some good time and conversations on our terrace. So as an entrepreneur who's running all this, 
in multi uh, dimensional ways, all with an efficiency model. Um, I'm sure your villas are efficiently run. Um, I'm sure the kids program, they have the best product and they are happy. And I know your love for children and wanting to give everybody all the opportunities. Um, we could do another program on that. Um, some of the best oh, yeah. entrepreneurs and the, the hardest businessmen are also the biggest givers. Um, and you know, they naturally want to see everyone around them succeed. Um, that's kind of what we do. Um, right. uh, but, uh, this passion, this passion that you have for ideas and decision making and cultures, um, passion for efficiency, your passion for family, your passion for fairness. Do you think it sets you apart? When you look at other people, do you think they have this much passion for getting involved in politics? I mean, you know, after making money and after you can do whatever you want to do. Your mind is, is amazing. You can put it to whatever you want, right? Um, a is passion, what separates you, and B, what is your goal? I mean, you've had this conversation, but what is the goal? What is the overarching goal? Well, you know, one thing we, we were talking with Scott before you came on, okay. <laughs> taking back from China is <laughs> eternal optimism. And, and um, it's for me, it kind of became not only eternal optimism, it became a um, being content with what you have. Mm. So I feel I'm in a, I'm in an extremely comfortable place. So when it comes to business philosophy, you can say, like my sister says, the comfort zone is a great place to be in, but nothing ever grows there. Um, so I, I'm in that place, but somehow I feel I have managed that something still grow around me and, and I'm still being comfortable with the way it's going. Uh, so I'm not that um, focused into new things anymore. Uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to find people who bring that passion, who bring that motivation, who bring that um, level of energy, uh, that, that, that vision, that drive uh, that I used to have back when I started and, and try to support them in, in either by supporting them with money or with ideas or guidance or uh, other ways that they, that they might seek help. Um, so it's become less of a doing everything myself. I'm starting to, oh, well, guess getting old i'm starting to get more comfort out of like i said creating my 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 own liquor so during the last uh years apart from the local walnut liquor i have done a blueberry liquor i've done a cherry liquor i've done a rose liquor this year uh i've done a mint liquor and uh i've i've done cooking i've i've learned a couple of the local croatian dishes uh and i've i've gone back to repairing things i'm, I'm starting to have a lot of fun just, just repairing the door of my garage uh repairing the coffee machine repairing some other things that before i would have just thrown away and bought a new one or given someone to repair because i don't have the time to do it it's actually not making any financial sense to do it myself but now it's it's become more of a, a hobby and, and, and enjoying those little things. Uh, uh, I, I've started the gin blog that I'm hoping to put online very soon. I've I've planted my uh, my my peppermint, my my thyme, my basil in the garden, and I'm trying to put a few few gin tonic recipes together. And, and all these things I'm, I'm playing around with now. So being creative, being an artist in some way of life, but not that much uh, of a focus on how can I make more money? How can I start another business? How can I win another fight? How can I uh, be the best in what I'm doing? It, it's become more of a confident, let's try. And I, I mean, I've already proven so many things that, that 
it's just about how can I make something small and beautiful uh, just for the sake of I mean, maybe it's Zen, maybe it's uh, I don't know uh, a part of yin and yang that that going hard after something for so long and now doing something totally opposite to that. Um, so, but I, I feel I'm, I'm, I'm in that circle where, where I'm, I'm in balance. Uh, I enjoy being with my wife and our kid. I enjoy uh, seeing the sun. I started sailing last year. I made my sailing license. I started Croatian classes. So I made my first A1 license in Croatian, now being the sixth language uh, that I'm learning. Uh, so, so I'm still active in that way, trying to, trying to learn new things. Um, but, but it's not what it used to be in China. It's not this, this, this immense focus on a project that has to be finished in time, that has to be uh, amazing, that has to be, I don't know, uh, absolutely successful, efficient, etc. It's, it's more of a enjoy life. And, and uh, with, with this corona, I mean, look at it. What is left in life when you look out? I've, I've already right. done everything that Corona tells me to do. So I've been working away from my office for the last 18 years. Uh, we've prepared our company to, to say as soon as the Corona warnings came up, we said to everybody, guess what? It's happening now, what we prepared for for the last 18 years. Uh, everybody go home because everything is ready. Just be with your people, be with your families. Right. Uh, the, the systems are there. Uh, right. The knowledge is there. Don't worry about if you can make it to work tomorrow or not because your kid is sick or your mom is sick or you are sick or somebody else is keeping you from doing your work because we've built a system as a company right. that makes sure we value you so much that we actually value you as a person more than the work that you're delivering for us as a company. And, uh, and, and that's what, what now a lot of companies are just recently understanding and more by, by outside market force than possibly by, by actually humanly believing that it's the right thing to do. Uh, that, that, yeah, it's not all about work. It's not all about being in the office. It's not all about, all about the product or the company. It's about the people that are coming together to create something, to, to spend their valuable lifetime together, putting energy into a project. And uh, and all this before Corona, we, we already had it ready. I mean, when somebody said, I'm, I'm gonna have to go home because kindergarten's off the next week, I'd say, of course, yeah, go home, work from home if you can. And if you can't, well, guess what? Then somebody else has to do it or, or we'll put it back on priority list until, until we find time to do it. That is the true definition of success. And I feel the same way about my business. Um, I've set up an efficient platform. And as soon as this crisis broke out, um, I also was very clear that no one should put themselves out there. We had prepared for this in terms of being an efficient company. Uh, we have discouraged working from an office. I'm a responsibility, similar to you, an objective focused, uh, similar to my son who's entering Montessori school. Um, they have a plan for the week. And when they finish that plan, you add more objectives on there and you keep going and you develop the next level. And so for me, it's always been objective focus um, and success has been survival. Success has been um, cultivating global relationships that can help me in every aspect of my business. So I've been very angry and I, I'm interested in your opinion here. I've been very angry at some of the largest companies in the United States. I'm not familiar with uh, Croatia or Germany or many other countries at this point and what they're doing with stimulus. But um, the loan program that we established here provided money um, for businesses who are struggling. And I understand that because there's a lot of businesses struggling and I wanted to see small and medium companies 
receive those dollars. But then I saw the applicants and forget the political side, you know, big companies, guys who have billions of dollars, guys who have in their 60s, 70s, 80s, hundreds of millions of dollars. And they were the first ones to line up to get money. And I said to myself, Bad, boy, boy, we need to uh, remove them from the Wikipedias. We need to stop praising these folks as great business people. I haven't taken one loan. I've given them and I've given no interest at a time. I've paid for people's rents. Okay. I've tried to go to people that I know that need help and offer them help if they need it in, as a friend. I wouldn't dare take a loan because people really need it. And so the idea of success isn't, to me, it's, it's redefined now in this corona era. It's not about how much money you have or how good people think you are. If you can't survive a couple months and you got your hand out to government to help you survive, then you are not an efficient operator. You are not an entrepreneur. From a definition, you accept no risk. If you haven't been in 20, 30 years, been able to build a business that can survive a couple months of a downturn, then you aren't you worse your salt. And it's offensive to read about these folks just money grabbing as everybody else who hasn't had the privilege of all these inside deals and years of probably low interest loans and, you know, a lot of support. They're sitting here saying, where's the money? I need support. And they're watching these pigs claim how good they are, needing money. And you watch them on CNBC being interviewed, you know, for their opinions. What do you feel about that as an entrepreneur and a guy who's in your position? Well, we, we took a total of two loans ever since we started WinRAR. The first one was from my dad to actually put the money in the bank account that you're required to by German law to create a limited company. And the second one was uh, out of pure anger that for many, many years as a startup and tech company, we weren't eligible to take any loan from our bank for right. growth. That I said, you know what, I'm going to take a loan from you just because I can, not because I need it. Right. So we got a credit line that we never used just for the sake of actually proving that we have credibility. Um, so I was lucky enough to, to be able to, to operate our business without outside funding, like I said, except for the money that we got from my dad to start. Um, so it's hard for me to say exactly who and how you need the money, when you need the money, how much you need. But I, I agree with you, let's put it that way. I agree with you that, that there is a lot wrong in our global econom economic and political system. And personally, when this crisis started, I was feeling, well, wouldn't it be cool if all the governments in the world would just say, you know what, we're gonna pay all salaries, everybody stay at home, and all companies that go broke because of that, well, guess what? We are in capitalism. So there's going to be laws, bankruptcy laws. There's going to be investors. There's going to be shareholders and all kinds of people who've made a lot of money from this company in the past that have extracted profits from this company in the past right. that might now have to return the money if this is actually still a viable business. And if it's not, well, the market might, like it always do, does, uh, come up with solutions by itself. Somebody else will take that niche. However, unfortunately, that's not how politics work globally. And um, 
So we have gotten into this paradox where I would say globally we have this amazingly strong capitalism that actually is nothing else than socialism. And uh, because when things go hard and crises hit, then it's always the government saving companies 100%. and not the capitalism being as brute and hard as it was the decades before, extracting profit from every single person that it can extract profit from, then being extracted by the market. No, it works until that point where we have to step in with tax money where those people who have worked hard for such a long time in their own jobs and are paying taxes now end up saving those companies that have nothing else to do than extract profit from them the moment they have received the money that they will get from the government. Correct. So this is, I think it's a sick system that we are in. Yes. And um, I am not sure how to break that cycle because at the same time that we are being in this system, uh, it, we're also having a, a, a disconnection from, from uh, politics. We're having a disconnection from decision making. Uh, I, I feel as, as somebody who loves democracy uh, that, that there is no real way anymore uh, that I can participate in the decision at least not in a way that is in line with the minimum or the, the, the minimal amount of time that I actually have left for politics after my day-to-day -day work. Technology so, has not progressed in that um, way, I'll tell it's, you. It's only, yeah. right. so, so we have democracy on, on a level of 1940, 1950, uh, where, where, uh, where um, profits are ma being made digitally. And, and everyone is being skimmed by a thousandth of a cent, uh, maybe even a millionth of a cent. Um, but on the other end, with a millionth of my time, I cannot do anything right. in politics. Right. So this is where I see a huge disconnect on, on politics side, but I don't know, we, we didn't... <laughs> want to talk about politics we didn't want we wanted to talk about efficiency in business but now that we got into this i think that that is one of the very very big uh challenges that humanity has to overcome and and, and it was now coming back to to the china topic and the experience that i had there it was amazing to see that what we think is the brute raw capitalism, Wall Street capitalism is the thing to see. And then you go to China and you see capitalism on a totally different scale, as in, um, I, I not necessarily call it capitalism, but, but, but market capturing and, and, and being the first in the market and, and grinding your elbows to make whenever you're in that niche nobody else is going to get in there until you've completely exploited all profit there is in that niche i haven't seen that anywhere the way i've seen it in china never and 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 compared right. to that capitalism in in <laughs> turbo capitalism in the us is like yeah that's child's play that's like <laughs> right. it's it's simple but on the other hand well you have a socialist system. You have a, a, a communist system, at least a one-party system, to be more correct, with all the negative sides. I'm not sure it's socialist. And, I think yes, it's... I agree. Well, some parts of it are, but yes, in general, yes, you have a one-party system only, and, and people like to call it socialist, but but it's it's not really. Um, but yes, so, um, so, so not, now we're seeing a... Uh, a clash of, of, of cultures coming up where we have this immensely brute capitalism uh, being played by, by China yep. uh, with a redistribution into their market where they very successfully managed to make uh, people believe that they're progressing on their personal level. So, the, so there's still a, a large belief of the one point uh, some billion people in China that they are the new uh, and next, if not already, superpower on the globe uh, versus the Western world that, that is now starting to realize 
We have our beliefs, we have our acceptance for Europe, and this U.S. sounds for sure since Trump and you know, but about rights still, but when it comes to politics being mixed with, uh, with, with uh, business and economy, we see big obstacles ahead of us. And, and, I, and that's why I say there is this huge discrepancy where I must say with everything going wrong in China about the way they're treating minorities and their, their judicial system and many other things, it's kind of uh, better solved the way they're managing to get their poorest uh, to, to progress. I don't, so I don't see that. I don't see that because... Yeah. I'm seeing it in this way. Sorry that I just interrupted. Yeah, no, no. So we don't get a misunderstanding. I'm, I'm talking purely on a on a financial level. So so seeing that that everyone is earning a little bit more than they used to last year, I think that's something that they are doing pretty well. Everyone having the feeling that yes, I can get to that point that at some point I can afford these expensive things as well. That old American dream thing. I think even though a lot of people fail in this in China, I think it's much closer to being achievable than it is in the in the Western world. But that's my personal opinion. You sure? I don't. Uh, I don't. I don't agree with that. I think that that was true ten years ago, um, and I think that China did an amazing job of bringing folks out of poverty. When this started in the 90s, it was amazingly poor and still is amazingly poor. Um, in many, like 650, 700 million people are still abject poverty in China. And the reason I disagree um, is because that has stopped. And you can see that from this crisis, uh, there has been no stimulus in China and workers, similar to a couple years ago, are just refusing to work and they're going home because the pay is not there. And workers that kept their job, similar everywhere else, have gotten a reduction. Right. But it's, ex it's especially Sorry. troubling in China because the inflation rate is so high from housing to food that um, you... I don't see that trajectory continuing. Um, uh, but more so, I think it's a global issue. I, I um, agree with everything you're saying. Uh, the, the reason why my opinion differs here is because I feel that the rest of the world is even doing it worse than China is. So that's, that's why, yes, you're right. There are social systems. There are, there are things that, uh, that catch people up. Yeah, I, I agree with you that in Europe, especially uh, especially in countries like Germany, uh, it's amazing that, that even if you lose your job forever, that the state is going to take care of you in a, in a level that, that basically will maintain. It's not much, but it will not make you uh, starve. It will not make you uh, lose uh, uh, your, your belief in life. Um, I, I agree with that. I agree that in China it's it's far from that. But what I was referring to was this this general divide between uh, the rich getting richer, the poor getting poorer, and and I feel that in in Europe and in the Western world, while the rich are not getting richer as rich as the Chinese are getting richer, the poor are actually getting poorer. And and that that that, that is my personal belief. I don't, Whereas, I don't, I don't China, see that statistically. I have that, uh, okay, but, but it's... It, 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 it could be, and, and we, 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 could, there, we could bring in more people to discuss this on stats and things, but my point is, I, I, my opinion is just that the Chinese market was on steroids um, and that you had so much influx of global manufacturing dollars uh, connected with such high borrowing costs if you really look at the books in China and like the healthcare system, there is no money. And you look at people here in the United States, they have access to healthcare, whereas in China, they really don't. Especially if you come from poor, if you're from Jiangxi province, um, or you're from Anhui, good luck. 
Um, and so I, I don't think that increase will continue. And one of the reasons I think it, and I think one of the, the most uh, troubling issues, uh, which has been pushed out as digital currency, is nothing more than tracking. At the China rose because of gray, black money. If you can't get a loan from the bank, you can surely get a loan from Heisha Hui or organized crime. Yeah. As they created a financial system that's digital now and everything's tracked, similar to what India did a couple of years ago by making everyone throw out their money, basically. Um, the fact is that there is going to be hard to raise money and the Chinese government needs money. And the amount of money that they haven't put in the system is staggering for that many people. And so what you're going to see, I think, is high inflation, low growth, which is stagflation, and more so a bunch of people with high expectations, like you said, like the rest of the world, that isn't going to go anywhere fast. And with a decelerating uh, uh, a growth trajectory, these people haven't seen that in 20 years. They thought everything was going to get a lot better. In the West, we know things go up and down. They've never really hit a hard cycle other than some stock markets. But either way, my thinking is moving outside of China, and I agree with you, the world is in geopolitical problems. And my assumption, and this pulls back on your banking uh, experience, is that while they're not talking about inflation now, the United States government put so much stimulus out there, almost $10 trillion. We increased the money supply by over 20, 19% in the first couple of weeks of the crisis. Okay. We are going to, as a world, China is the most inflated environment I've ever seen. I, it reminds me of some of what I saw in 97 in Thailand, even though the, the, there was a lot of patches of inflation and deflation that occurred as you toured Asia in 97, okay, um, based on things not being able to be gotten, scarce resources, um, no money, uh, banking, no loans. Um, so I think what we're doing as a globe is heading into a high interest rate environment and very few companies um, – will be able to maneuver as they have high debt levels globally. And you're going to have interest rates over the next couple of years go up a lot faster than people think. There's a real hesitancy to it because they think that's the way right now. The theology is to get money out there. But we've just put so much money out there, right? You're going to continue to put more. You want to tax people in France for, for putting money in their savings accounts. My point is that that end is coming. Inflation, interest rates increasing is coming. What's the world going to do when we're sitting with trillions of debt, no access to loans in a couple of years, and high interest rates, high borrowing costs? Oh, to me, it's an entrepreneur's paradise. You and me are going to start looking at this world and Scott a little differently. Because we have access, we, we have, as entrepreneurs, built our empires without the help of banks. Because they didn't help, like you said, they didn't help me from the beginning. When I needed loans in my 20s, when I needed access to an account that taught me how to do things, my parents, my family didn't teach me that, right? No one mentored me. You're the closest mentor I've ever had, and we're about the same age. I'm 41, you're 44. We learn from each other. So my point is now... We're cash positive. We have all the global experience and we're ready to pick through assets. As everything else becomes inflated, it's our time to shine in the next couple of years because true entrepreneurs with efficiency are who's going to rule the roost. What do you say to that stuff? Unless you're sailing in the Mediterranean and happy about catching a fish a day and not worrying about anything at all. No, I agree. You're totally right. And, and there's... there's uh, Big opportunities coming, big turmoil. This is what I love about crisis. It's always opportunity and risk. So um, be ready. That's what 
this is the time to to start new things, to be looking at at opportunities and and being the first to see that the world is changing. I mean, we for me personally, in the in the forty four years that I've seen life, uh, apart from the, uh, the the mobile phone and internet being around everything, uh, this is the next big change. Is how 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 do we how do we keep a, a virus like this out of our life? How do we uh, stay efficient? How do we stay functioning as a company? I mean, think about all those airplanes on the ground. Think about uh, companies like Boeing and Airbus not being able to sell planes for the next ten years. Uh, and and other companies now saying, well, we're going to turn uh, turn wine into to hand disinfectant and makes millions out of it. Uh, we're going to turn socks into to face masks and make millions out of it. Uh, there's going to be uh, uh, companies like like Zoom uh, coming up and and being in video conferencing. Companies like DocuSign finally. Uh, becoming a, a standard in the market. Uh, companies like Amazon, uh, Google, Apple, Microsoft doing their thing the way they've been doing on a totally new uh, level now. And uh, it's it's a new world out there. That's that's all I can say. It's We, we don't know what's coming. Uh, if, if you're an entrepreneur and you want to do something, all I can say is go for it. There's enough opportunities. There's uh, enough people that think they know better. So if you have an idea and you think it's going to work, uh, go for it. Don't don't let anybody discourage you. Uh, it's a new world. Nobody really knows what's going on. Nobody knew, knew, knows what will happen tomorrow or next week. Um, so yeah, if you if if you want to take a risk, I agree. Now's the time to do it. I will give Scott the last word, last segment here, last question. But I would just want to say, Barack, thank you for doing this. This two hours and some minutes has uh, been quite um, cathartic for me. Uh, our meeting in Buffalo uh, 20 years ago um, uh, and having the chance to, to, to watch you work over a 20-year period, uh, I marvel at your accomplishments. I tell you this in private all the time, so this is not for a show. Um, me and you are pretty uh, direct, pragmatic people. Um, but you're absolutely uh, the greatest entrepreneur. I know billionaires. Uh, I know guys that uh, might make more money than you. I don't know your money. We don't talk money. Um, but um, they don't have uh, the depth and the model and the efficiency that you have that I've witnessed. Not to take away from them, but I've learned. My point is from, from a growth standpoint. I've learned more watching you develop your business and just talking to you than I've learned from anyone else. So I thought I think that the people watching this program today um, really got a treat. And I thank you for your time, sir. I mean that, Scott. Yeah, You're um, very welcome, my friend. I mean that last that last piece you gave was was really really good. Um, so so my my final question, um, I want you to answer it twice for two different types of people. Um, so there, there are two. There, there are those entrepreneurs that you know have the business and they're ready to to take that, to elevate that, to optimize that, to go to the next level. And then there are those who are just starting out. Um, what they don't have the business yet. They, they may even you know just be formulating the idea, or you know they're just on the cusp. Um, so for for anyone for for both of those parties, like what would your advice to them be in order to you know optimize their operations and and get that efficiency? Um, that you have and that you've developed. Um, how, how would you recommend that each one of those groups of people uh, approach doing that with their business or their soon-to-be business? Well, as for companies that that have been around and that uh, that now face this this totally new situation, um, I think there's two two things you can do, and and one is something we always use as as our business compass basically, is what is our core business? What is it that we are actually really doing and making money with? Um, in such situations, that's probably something you have to be very, very aware of to know you're not being sidetracked into some adventures with unknown uh, outcome. 
uh, you got to be in, in a crisis. You, you got to know that your engine works. You got to know that your cash flow is working. You got to know that whatever you are the best at right. is what you're the best at. And um, so, so that's the one thing you have to do. The other thing is um, you have to be on your toes and now actually do the opposite of what I was saying. You got to question everything because what you have been the best in until just now may absolutely be unnecessary tomorrow. So uh, like, like I was saying, if you're Airbus and Boeing, you're now facing, will I ever actually sell a plane again? Um, and, and that's a very tough question for a company that's really good at building airplanes. So um, you might have to, to, to come to a point where you're actually saying, either I'm going to go all in, I'm going to double down here and, and do whatever it takes, or you may have to say, guess what? The time has come. We must do something completely different now. Right. And that's up to everyone. Uh, that's something you can only decide as, as a company, as the one who's doing their business. That's something I can't tell you. But uh, now is the time to, to do those yin-yang questions. You got to ask, what am I? Where, where am I going? What have I been? And is this still the right thing to do? Uh, or do I have to question everything that, that, uh, that I've been doing so far? Because uh, yeah, we're going to go down the hill. <laughs> we're going to down, go off a cliff if we don't change things. Um, so, so that's one. Uh, as for the people who are starting things, um, it's kind of similar as in uh, you have to know what you want to do. Uh, but it's more easy because, because you're not risking as much. Uh, you can still make a lot of mistakes. You can still try um, and find your way. Um, so, so that is a general advice that I, that I will give anybody regardless of, of a crisis situation that we're in now, is what are you good at? What, what is it that you really want to do? What is it that you believe in? And, uh, and then follow that. Um, it's, it's always a question of bringing heart and, and mind together. And, uh, and that's the same today as it was before Corona. So uh, what does your mind say? What does your heart say? Does it feel right what you're doing? Does it seem right what you're doing? Uh, those are the questions you're going to have to ask yourself over and over. And what I'm saying, like I said before, is don't, don't let anybody else uh, uh, get you off your path. Yes, have people challenge you. Try to have mentors who will ask the tough questions. Uh, but, but if you know you're right, or if you feel you're right, then you probably are, because that's the difference in this crisis situation. Nobody has been in this crisis before. Nobody really knows better. Right. So follow, follow on that instinct or that, that idea or that drive, however you right. want to call it. Right. And uh, don't let people stop you. I mean, that's, that's the saddest thing I, I feel in entrepreneurship. That, that people are so negative about what you want to do that, that people then give up just because other people didn't believe enough in them. That's not it. you got to believe in yourself. And if there is 8 billion other people who don't believe you, that doesn't mean that those 8 billion are right. You may be that single one out of 8 billion that is thinking of this for the very first time or in a different way than everybody else has before. So go for it, man. Right. Don't don't let anybody else give you doubts and then follow through with it. I mean, people told me before everybody's like, yeah, where are this? When are that? It's the bottom of this pit. You can do everything. You can do nothing. It's like, no, it's like we want to do our thing. <laughs> That's what we feel is the right thing to do. So we're doing it. We're going to take mistakes. Of course, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to go into new markets. We're going to not know what we're heading into. We had the dot-com bubble. We had the financial crisis. We had several uh, things happening uh, during this time that, that I've been around with WinRAR. And yeah, so we're still going. I mean, in the in the start, our, our tax advisor asked us, Andrew Brock, how many years do you think this company is going to operate? And we said, well, maybe three to five. What if stuff changes something? What if another big player comes in? We can't control it. Let's say three to five. And he's been playing this game with us every year. He's been asking us, Barack, Angel, how long do you think this, this operation can run? 
And for the last 18 years, we've been saying, well, guess what? Three to five years. Yeah. So, <laughs> it hasn't changed. It's always yeah. three to five. Um, and, okay. So, and, and then last slide. So what, what would you say, like, like how can, um, how can people, entrepreneurs, business owners, how can they begin to turn their business into the model of efficiency like yours? Like what, you know, what should their first steps be? Is it just making a bunch of checklists for processes? Is it <laughs> you know, over a week and figure out what needs to be proceduralized? Like what, like, like what are the first steps that people need to take in order to, you know, have the, the Brock John Boy model, you know, working for them? Um, well, I've been describing something which are the, um, the the startup framework here at the university in Split, um, where I'm basically saying, well, it would be cool if, if you have a, a kind of toolkit that you can uh, work with. Um, it, it doesn't exist yet in that way, but I think you can do that for yourself when you start. So, so I'm talking when I'm in toolkit, I'm saying things like, uh, uh, which uh, project management tool do we want to use? Uh, how do we want to use uh, contracts? Uh, do we what kind of uh, system or do we want to base our things on Microsoft Office or on Google? Uh, what are the advantages disadvantages of each? And uh, what what's going to be our mail service system? What's going to be our website system, etc. So I think these kind of things you should at the very beginning spend some time on and uh, get. get enough knowledge to say, you know what, this is what I want to work with. This is what I'm going to stick with for the next yeah. five to 10 years. Uh, there's not going to be a perfect solution anyways. So don't worry about trying to find the perfect one to work with. Just find the one that you can work with and that helps you in that moment. And don't keep go going back and questioning that tool that I have is the right one. You will find out if it's not the right one at some point when you've gathered enough experience with what you actually need and what the the, the problems with the tools that you have are. Uh, but yeah, so I'd say put together your tools, find somebody who who you trust or go online and look for things. What Like I said, what project management do I want to use? What knowledge management system do I want to use? Uh, what email system do I want to use? Uh, what, what office system I want to use? And and stick to that. Everything has limitations, but there's also a, a, a lot of comfort in actually not having to worry all the time if the tool is the right one. So use it. Just use it until you know that something else is the better tool. Um, the same is true for, for, uh, for contracts. Try to find someone who will manufacture you the contracts in a cheap way or that you that you can partner up with. So I think lawyers are, are a very crucial part of, of your business. You have to, to trust uh, this guy and you have to make sure that you have a person, guy, girl, doesn't matter, uh, that that is able to help you with the needs that you have at the point. It doesn't make sense to pay $20,000 uh, to a lawyer if you're not making that money and, and your, your business is worth five. So find someone who says uh, all right guys i'm going to help you guys it's going to cost you maybe let's say 100 bucks a month but i'm going to do some kind of subscription model where i'm going to support you guys whatever contracts you're going to need i'm going to make sure that that's something that uh, that i will take care of for you that your employment contracts are always up to date that your uh, contracts for for manufacturing are up to date or whatever kind of contracts you need in your business uh, are up to date. So lawyer, yes, find somebody. Tax advisor, accounting, find somebody. Uh, and uh, I think what, what helped us a lot in the beginning was uh, our tech guys telling me, Barack, you need a secretary. Don't yeah. get, don't waste time with, with, with uh, sorting all these things. Right. So that's that's my definitely the 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 advice I would give every entrepreneur, and I'm still actually doing that day with everyone I'm talking to as soon as you can find a secretary get rid of that load of organizational stuff that slows you down right and uh, uh, because it's coming back to what I was saying in the beginning you got to use your brain here you got to concentrate on on your company you got to concentrate on on where to take your product or or your service and and it's not going to help you wondering if the mail goes in 
in time if uh, if if the the bills are being sorted properly if your uh, if your paperwork is in place so, so no, we, get some I mean, paperwork. is basically what you're saying like a, so a kind of offloading like as soon as you can like cognitively offload you know all absolutely of absolutely so so uh, i would say yes so so like i said accountant and 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 legal advice those the two things that are so high specialized in every country that it's hard to say uh, do it this way or another so i'd say find somebody who comes highly recommended and like, like i said who's ready to go with you so both our tax advisor and our lawyer are still with us from the very beginning because both of them said you know what we know you're starting we're not going to charge you our normal fees uh but don't run away whenever we make something wrong. If if something happens, promise us we'll talk about things and solve the issues, because we're going to support you growing, and we don't want to run. We don't want to have you run off to the next best accountant or tax advisor or 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 lawyer uh, just because you think you've outgrown us at some point. So it's about fairness here again. Uh, try to find somebody you feel comfortable with taking care of that for you, who, who feels comfortable supporting you to grow. If you can't find one and can't afford one by yourself, try to find two or three other partners who have a similar problem like you do. So try to build a cooperative that says, okay, well, we are now four or five companies who all need a, a, a properly drafted uh, employment contract. We all need a properly drafted uh, programmer developer contract. We need a production contract or whatever it is, that kind of contract that you will need. Uh, and then try to save the cost by, by, by sharing with others that have the same problem. But like I said, those two fields, yes, uh, definitely find help. Don't worry about it too much. And then, like you said, offload. Find somebody who takes the burden off of you so you can focus on, back to it, what, what I said before, what is your core service? What is your core product? What is your core strength? Focus on that. Try to focus on that always. And hopefully that's something that, that works with any strike as well. And, and to all the fighters out there listening, like if you got something that you do really well, use it, perfect it, and, and, and be the one who's the only one who can do it the way you're doing it. If that leads you to success, stick to it, do it well, and don't let others uh, uh, get you off of your path. Brett, thank you so much. Before you go, how can people find more about you? How can they read more about your philosophy? You got you got social media, you got books. Like how how do people you know get to know Brett John Boy better? Well, I, I don't have much uh, of both. Uh, I did put together a little YouTube channel. So if you if you put my name in, uh, uh, you'll find a couple of videos, and I will add this video also to the channel if you allow me to. So. Uh, uh, there's a few things. Uh, I, I have a profile on LinkedIn where I have shared a couple of, uh, of presentations. Uh, but yes, I'm actually I'm actually using this also as a motivation to do more videos and interviews like this. So look out for a couple of Winrar memes presented by the Winrar CEO personally, nice. and I'm telling a couple of stories of how we got here. Very. Uh, cool. Very cool. Barack, Adam, Paul, thank you both. It's always a pleasure. I'm my friend. And uh, I hope to have you back on the show sometime. Thanks for your time. Knowledge. Be, safe, be healthy. Bye-bye.